My name is Brian Birch, and I have the pleasure of serving as director for the Center of the Center for the Study of Ethics here at UVU, and in partnering with our friends and colleagues at the Woodbury School of Business. This award honors the memory of Kirk Engelhart, a local businessman whose private and public life exemplified honor, conscientiousness, and humility. Virtues that serve as the foundation for ethical practices, not only in business, but in all, as in all facets of human life. As many of you know, Kirk is the late husband of Elaine Engelhart, who founded and developed the ethics program here at UVU and which has been nationally recognized and awarded for its work in developing ethical theory and practice across the curriculum. We want to uh, extend a special welcome to, to Elaine and to all the members of her family who are coming in from out of town. It's our pleasure to have you here. It is fitting that we are honoring Robert Grow with this award. I sent strong parallels between Kirk and Robert. Both appear to be Renaissance men. Both have a strong foundation in business, but they are also curious individuals who enjoy a variety of people, activities, and ideas. My brief introduction here this morning in no way does full justice to the work and impact of this man on the state of Utah and across the nation. Robert J. Grow is currently the president and chief executive officer for Envision Utah, an organization committed to a collaborative, values-based approach to developing long-term planning for the future of the great state of Utah. Envision Utah's unique visioning process, for example, empowered Utah residents and civic leaders to make well-informed choices about their future, and with a focus not, er not merely for their own quality of life, but on the quality of life for those of future generations. From 1997 to 1999, Envision Utah conducted public values research and held over 200 workshops, surveyed more than 20,000 residents, convened business, governmental, and educational leaders, along with policy and lawmakers in developing these long-term strategies. Envision Utah is committed to what it calls quality growth, and this means much more than the economic vitality of our region, though it certainly does include this. It also involves sustainable development that looks more holistically at community well-being and reaches out to those constituencies whose lives are impacted by these strategies and policies. This innovative approach has been emulated by more than 80 cities and metropolitan regions across the United States. Robert has led visioning teams in San Diego, Hawaii, Arizona, and southern Louisiana in the aftermath of hurricanes Katrina and Rita. He was also instrumental in the strategy and development of Kennecott Land Company's Daybreak community in the southwestern part of the Salt Lake Valley. This project has served as a national model for sustainable communities and has been a beautiful addition to the Wasatch Front. Finally, and of course I could go on at length, Robert was instrumental in the development of Utah's transportation network, including tracks and Front Runner. For this work, he received the American Public Transportation Association's Distinguished Service Award in 2003. Prior to his service at Envision Utah, Robert served as president of Geneva Steel and as mission president for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Sacramento, California mission. He holds degrees in engineering and law from the University of Utah and Brigham Young University. And I don't know where Robert's loyalties ultimately lie here, so I can only hope that they involve more crimson red than royal blue. <laughs> Today we honor his commitment to collaboration, cooperation, holistic thinking, and vision. Like Kirk Engelhart, his life has exemplified the best virtues of business ethics and a concern for the well-being of all humanity. The title of his remarks is, A Principled Approach to Keeping Utah Beautiful, Prosperous, Healthy, and Neighborly. Please join me in welcoming Robert Groh to the stand, along with Vice, Senior Vice President Jeff Olson, Elaine Engelhart, Dean Wright, Brad Mertz, for the citation and the formal presentation of the award.
Probably with this guy right next to the jet. Okay. The Excellence in Business Ethics Award is annually presented by the UVU President and Board of the Center for the Study of Ethics to an individual who displays exemplary ethics both professionally and personally. Exemplary ethics demonstrates a sustained commitment to understanding the necessity of integrity and humanity in business pursuits. This individual demonstrates strengthening business ethics through fiscal responsibility, leadership, civic activity, and personal example. Robert J. Grow, we believe that you exemplify the traits attained by the individual who practices excellence in business ethics. On behalf of Utah Valley University, the students, the faculty, the administration, the boards, and the surrounding community, we present you with this award. Thank you so much. It's a profound and humbling honor to receive the Kirk Engelhart Ethics Award today. Uh, it will become obvious to you very quickly that I am not trained in ethics as an academic subject, nor do I know the ins and outs of teaching ethics. So the best thing I can do today is talk from my own experience in my own words, and I hope that will be helpful to you. I hope it will be more like a smorgasbord set before you where if there's something that will help you in your life as you think about the future, that you'll take that, that one or two things and apply it. Well, you know, we are all confronted early in life with challenges to make good choices. When I was a, a student in seventh grade, uh, I sat in the front of my seventh grade science class. Uh, the teacher, having a group of rowdy boys in the back of the class, had a really bright idea one morning, and he called me and said, I'm going to put you in the back with the other boys and see if that will help them behave better. You can sort of get a hint of where this story is going. So he moved me to the back of the class, and about 10 days later, after a couple of disastrous experiences that I won't describe in detail, he called me in and moved me back to the front of the class and said, I put you back there to help the others be better. And the problem was you became just like them. <laughs> uh, at that young age, I, I was not strong enough uh, to hold my ground under peer pressure. Uh, and we all need help doing that in life. I told one of my friends that today an ethics award was being awarded to a lawyer. And my apologies to the lawyers in the room. But he found that astonishing that a lawyer was receiving an ethics award. I reminded him I was also an engineer, so I did have some redeeming social value in my life. <laughs> um, he was not amused, because he was also a lawyer. Uh, it may surprise you that lawyers actually operate under a very specific code of conduct and, eth and ethics about putting your client's interests before your own, about keeping their confidences, about helping them achieve their goals in life, there are rules about how to be honest in front of a court in an adversarial system. Uh, there are rules about how to treat your colleagues with civility. Uh, I have children here today, and my children do lots of things. They're professors and accountants and businessmen and lawyers and engineers, and all of them have a code. Oh, I forgot the historian and historian. Uh, all of them have codes of ethics or responsibility that go with their profession. Uh, some people think those things are constraining in their life. They kick against them. But I have always been thankful for the code of ethics that I've had in my life as an engineer and a lawyer 
which have helped me toe the line when things were tough. An important part of, more important perhaps than the professional codes of ethics, are personal codes of conduct. Uh, beginning nearly three decades ago, Elaine Engelhardt and others helped create and energize a national movement called Ethics Across the Curric Curriculum. Many of you are beneficiaries of that effort. Her ideas were not initially accepted by some in Utah, particularly in the political arena. But over the last 30 years, she has persevered, and this program that you are, many of you will be part of, I think all of you will be part of in one way or another, is a result of the perseverance that it takes to make really good but challenging things happen in life. She's fought the good fight. She's a champion of the very kinds of ethics and ethical conduct that she hopes you will learn. She has helped create a program here which allows each of you to find your own personal compass, your own personal code of ethics as you move through life. Um, I, I, I love learning about people's names. The name Engelhart comes from two German words. Engel means angel, and heart means hearty or strong. So the name Engelhart means strong or courageous angel. And I felt that this was fitting, both for the name of the award, but especially for her and her efforts. We also have here today Michael Pritchard, who's one of the other champions and pioneers of this field uh, from another university in the Midwest. Uh, I am so pleased, and it might surprise you that I went home to my library after talking with her, and I found a book I bought in 1993 called Ethics and Life, an Interdisciplinary Approach to Moral Problems, authored by Helene Engelhardt. So I actually bought this in 1993, so how many years ago? That's almost a quarter of a century ago, and thumbed through the business portion of it as I was leading a corporation at that time in my life. You never know how and where your influence will be felt. So my hat is off to those at UVU who have championed and supported and developed this program, which has become a national movement that all of us need help in making good decisions and having a laboratory in college where you can develop that personal compass is such an important part of that. By the way, my remarks today, Elaine and I made up my, the title for my remarks today. You know, a principled approach to keeping Utah beautiful, prosperous, healthy, neighborly. Beautiful, prosperous, and healthy and neighborly for future generations is the mission statement of Envision Utah. A principled approach comes, on the other hand, from the process of Envision Utah, about two things in that process, how it is based on a foundation of values, how we seek to understand what Utahns dearly want and hope for, their aspirations and dreams, and create the place that will best facilitate and fulfill those hopes. Uh, that's the first thing. We base what we do on values. The second aspect is a, it's about a, a co collaborative, inclusive process of gathering together everybody who can help you solve or needs to be part of solving a challenging problem or issue. And I've become a big believer that there are very few ways in life to change difficult or challenging things without that kind of approach. At a fundamental level, Envision Utah is about creating a place that best helps Utahns achieve what they want for their children and grandchildren. And just as UVU is known across America for leading in a national movement in this ethics across the curriculum, Envision Utah has become recognized nationally and in some places internationally for pioneering the concept of values research, envisioning and long-range strategic planning for the future of states and regions in America. I've personally been to more than 100 regions of the United States helping them understand how you apply values and thinking about and planning for the future. Now, it's interesting as we've studied Utahns for two decades over and over again, we've learned to come and understand their values orientation to the physical world in which we live, both the man-made world and uh, the natural world. And you can, you can wrap up their hopes about a place in those four words, beautiful, prosperous, healthy, and neighborly. We want Utah to be a place where we preserve and protect the natural beauty and environment so we and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren can go there and enjoy the great outdoors. We want a Utah that has a prosperous economy that lifts everyone and provides everyone with an opportunity to work and find a decent place to live 
and to participate and add to the, to the, to the quality of the places we live. We want a place where the air is healthy, where the water is clean. We want a place where our neighborhoods are safe and our lives are secure. Utahns want a place that welcomes every newcomer and treats them with respect and fairness. That's the kind of place Utahns think about as they think about place building. And Utah has a history, a very strong history, of creating places for people that will be good for them. And Envision Utah is a part of a long tradition of builders, generation after generation, who've tried to do the right thing and have built for the generations to come. Nothing matters more than values, particularly as we make choices for Utah's future. Values are the foundation of all principled action in our lives. If we constantly stay focused on the values, on the things that matter most, our children and grandchildren will be the beneficiaries. I've had many different uh, careers in my life. You heard about some of them. I've been an engineer, a lawyer, the president and chief operating officer of a large manufacturing company, a mission president, a consultant on large-scale developments around America, and a national advisor on strategic planning for American cities and regions. I've always had a passionate interest in the future of Utah, but I'm also trained as an engineer, and a, and a systems engineer was my focus. I learned and was taught how to take systems that weren't running well and how to tune them up, make them more efficient, make them more effective. After engineering school, I went to law school where I learned the rules of our society, how we make things happen or don't happen in our culture. And so this, this concept of applying systems theory to how we grow Utah is at the foundation of Envision Utah. If you're not familiar with a, with a sort of a business book called The Goal on the Theory of Constraints, I would suggest you read it if you want to get things done wherever you go. The other thing I'd suggest you read, particularly for your generation, has to do, is, is, is championed, is a theory championed by a Harvard law professor, excuse me, well, that was a bad one, a Harvard business professor um, <laughs> named Clayton Christensen. It's the theory of, const uh, the theory of disruptive technologies. And so I'd invite you to think about and learn about the theory of disruptive technologies, the theory of constraints, both of which are about systems to make change. And Envision Utah is actually based in part on both of those theories of the way things actually get done. You know, we all come in early in our lives to feelings about how we should treat one another. And process, when I use the word process, that's what I mean. How do we get things done? in our culture and process is largely about how we treat each other. I had some, some memories, and I'm sure you do, that are emblazoned in my mind about my childhood that affected the way I felt about how, and how I thought about treating one another, how I would treat others, and how I wanted to be treated. One, is, one of them is very painful. Early in fourth grade, they finally discovered I couldn't read. I had faked my way to fourth grade, not able to look at a piece of paper with words on it and read them. I had a very good memory, and so I had been very successful at faking it till then, but no longer. One day, the principal of the elementary school came to my class and pulled me out, and he, as he marched me down to his office in a very brusque sort of way, he pointed in a classroom at a third grader and said, we held that kid back. He's lazy like you, and we're going to hold him back too. We then proceeded to the office where a phone call was placed to my mother to tell her that my academic career had ended. <laughs> now, he couldn't be bothered with thinking about me and my problem. No effort was made to diagnose it in the academic setting. My mother took me to experts and soon they diagnosed that I had dyslexia, that I reversed things in my mind, and that I had a challenge I needed to overcome. It wasn't the school system that helped me. It was my mother who spent a year tutoring me carefully in phonetics and reading and how to work with words on a page so that I could learn how to learn. It took me until I was a senior in high school to finally get a National Honor Society. I was better in college, and by the time of law school, I had progressed to the point where I was an excellent student. 
But that challenge, the way I was treated at the front of that challenge, I've never forgotten. And it, it has driven me to try and pe treat people with issues differently and better than I was treated at that point. Uh, another very emotional experience that happened to me happened on a scout trip to Lehman Caves when I was 12 years old. Lehman Caves is in Nevada and the long trip back. Uh, a scout leader who had a very strong political persuasion and attitude uh, verbally abused my older brother, who was just 18 months older than me, on the entire trip about our, our parents' political views and used his power in a setting that should have been warm and welcoming to cause him a tremendous emotional distress, and me too, as I watched this happen. Every one of you has had experiences with authority, and sometimes we learn to despise and hate authority. I went through a short phase like that, where authority, any, any organization that had authority over me, I pushed back on. But I learned over time that you could actually influence the systems and the organizations to treat people differently. Um, I had great examples when I was young as well. I had a scoutmaster who sort of took me under his wing and told me that I could actually become a leader someday. Um, there, was a, there was a political science professor at the University of Utah. Many of you won't know, but some of the faculty know, known J.D. Williams. J.D. Williams was a friend of my dad's. He was uh, nationally known just a brilliant scholar on the Constitution. And when I had questions when I was a teenager growing up about politics and history, my dad would just say, well, call JD. You know, I'd call this really busy professor. And he'd get on the phone with me. I remember calling him once and asking him, what is a Fabian economist? And he dictated a long answer to me, and then he took time to teach me and explain it to me. Uh, I learned early on that so much of life that matters is about mentoring and lifting other people. And so you can see in me uh, sort of growing through all of this towards a kind of process about the way we should treat one another and how we really ought to get things done. Um, I served as an LDS missionary. I was in the military. Uh, I joke that in the military, and I love those who serve our country, and I love our country, but I certainly butted up against the, butted up against the system that at, wanted to learn absolutely nothing from me about anything um, in the military. And so all of these things came together to sort of frame who I was and my thinking. Uh, do any of you remember the Geneva Steel Plant, the big steel plant on the lake? Uh, I helped buy the Geneva Plant in 1987. Uh, I was there for 10 years, and during that, that 10 years, I led the effort to modernize Geneva Steel, try and bring it into this century so it would last. Uh, Geneva dominated the landscape of Utah counties. One commentator in the newspaper called it the ogre's castle on the lake. That was actually my favorite description of the plant, uh, which came from Robert Kirby, who some of you may know. Um, Geneva was massive. Uh, it had 1,600 acres of land, had 100 miles of internal railroad. You could put 132 football fields under its roofs, and it produced enough steel in a week to build a 110-story office building in Chicago. People have no idea how big that was. It was, a World War, it was a World War II plant built to be out of the range of Japanese bombers, and we built the ships that won World War II largely from the steel on the west coast, largely from the steel that was made at this plant. When we bought the plant, I was both a lawyer and engineer, and I was pretty cocky that I knew how to run a steel plant. Uh, I, I was in for a very rude awakening. I, I started the study, and I read The Making, Shaping, and Treating of Steel. It's about this thick. It's highly technical about everything about steel making. They call it the Bible of steel making within the industry. But more importantly, you could find me almost any night, and I used to go home late a lot, out in the plant, wandering around, sitting next to union workers, and I'd sit down next to them, and they'd see the name on, the, on my, my helmet, and they'd go, wow, <laughs> and they'd get very nervous. And I'd sit there, and we'd chat, and we'd chat about their kids and their family, and then I'd start asking questions. Why do we do it that way? And he's running a big piece of equipment. Is there a better way to do that? Have you thought about, uh, do you have any suggestions on how to improve this process? Could we speed it up? Could we make it more accurate? 
And little by little, I began to learn steel making from experts. I learned that everybody has something they could teach me. And there were 2,400 workers at the plant, and I met literally hundreds of them by sitting at their side as they ran the equipment uh, and as they worked with me. And it was a surprise for them, too. The workers at the plant under U.S. Steel had never had one of the bosses come out and sit next to them and actually ask them how to run a steel plant. And so they enjoyed sharing, and I made friends. It's one of my fondest experiences from Geneva. One of them actually taught me how to run the 250-ton overhead crane that could have picked up 100 cars at one time. And then he handed me the thing and said, here, try this. So I got to try all the equipment at Geneva, usually late at night when there wasn't a shop steward around uh, to object. And you know, I, I even crashed up some steel in the rolling mill one night, which I never told anybody except for the guy who saw me do it. Um, and so learning from others, part of the process of way we respect and treat others is re recognizing that being a little more humble and talking less and, and listening more often gets you a longer way in life. When I'd been at Geneva for about five years, I joined the board of a group called the Coalition for Utah's Future. Um, the coalition had a byline. It was finding common good, excuse me, finding common ground for the common good. Finding common ground for the common good. It was a group who had been trying to make changes in Utah for a long time. Uh, Bonner Ritchie, who some of you know, was a member of that board and is a true hero of mine. He was an organizational behavior professor who told me an organization we were dreaming of as we sort of were planning in the coalition in a subcommittee for how to deal with growth issues in Utah. And I soon became head of that subcommittee because I knew about land use planning and zoning. And at Geneva, I'd learned about water rights and about air quality and about trains. Uh, all of those things had sort of come together. So they, I ended up being chair of this subcommittee as we tried to design a process. Envision Utah and its process was incubated in the Coalition for Utah's Future. Bonner Ritchie was one of those who had deep feelings about how you treat pro each, one another and solve problems. Uh, I brought with it my system, to it my systems expertise and my feelings about how we treat one another, and there the process of Envision Utah was born. It's not a complicated process, and it makes a lot of sense just because it is really very simple. Get everybody together who has an interest in this problem, who can either help a change or affect change, or who can block change. It's not just your friends, it's everybody. Get them around a very large table and start talking about the issue. Study the values of Utahns and where they want to go, and then work with these experts who understand the problem to ch come up with choices or scenarios for the future. How, what, if Utahns decide this today, where will we end up tomorrow? If they de decide this, where will we end up? And with those kind of clear choices, then you go to the public and say, help us. W now apply your values. Which of these directions do you want Utah to go? And that was the process that we designed. We kicked off the first effort in 1997, January 1997, and it, it lasted through 1999. One of the great things that happened in that was that Utahns, who had voted down an effort to build a rail system in Utah just a few years earlier, that Utahns decided that having a rail system by 2020, as we added another million people to the Wasatch Front and Back, would actually be a very, very important thing. And so part of the quality growth strategy, which came out of that first visioning effort, uh, was to build a high quality public transportation system in Utah. How many of you have ridden on front runner tracks? If you've ridden on front runner tracks, you like it? I mean, can you imagine Utah without it now? Okay, they just widened I-15 all the way up from here all the way up through the Salt Lake Valley. They're doing the point of the mountain right now. I can promise you it will be just as crowded as before that in another seven or eight years. In the long run, building a backbone train system in Utah that doesn't run in the traffic will be, have been a tremendous accomplishment, but it didn't happen easily. First, we started with the stakeholders. Then we modeled scenarios. Uh, then we took those scenarios to the public, and when the public responded, over 20,000 of them, they said, 84% of them said, build a rail system and build it as fast as we can do it. That was a big change in the, where we were headed in Utah. Now, it wasn't easy 
from there on. I received an award for, in 2002 for having, us having conceived of this idea and changing the public's attitude. But we were a long ways from having a rail system that was really a system for the future. So what happened? The business community was involved in Envision Utah. They became champions at the legislature for raising the headroom on the sales tax we needed. And the legislature then voted to do it. We had support from the executive branch of government and several governors. Uh, Spencer Eccles, who some of you, a name you may have heard of, uh, was on the board of the Union Pacific Railroad and he started pushing inside the Union Pacific to help us buy rail lines. But then I had the opportunity to take the vice president of, it's how you get rid of things, asset dis disposition uh, of the Union Pacific Railroad. I took him for a day on a, a drive in my car where I went all along the rail lines, the excess rail lines they owned in these valleys, and helped him envision what we could create on what they were eventually going to get rid of. He bought into the vision. He became convinced. He promised me he would go back and champion this within the Union Pacific. Then it took five years of hard negotiations. And finally, five years later, the state was able to buy about 180 miles of rail from the Union Pacific for about $185 million. Tracks, front runner, they all run on that rail system. But then we had to build a system on top of those rights of way. And one by one, we had to, to engineer, design, get, get the additional rights of way, and bring people together. But most importantly, Utahns had to choose to fund it. And in a 10 year period, Utahns voted twice. After they saw the scenarios and their choices for the future, they voted twice to tax themselves, sales tax, to tax themselves to build that system. The first one built a few lines. People tried it out. They fell in love with it. And then we had a second vote. And that second vote said, let's take everything we've planned for 2030 and build it in Utah by 2015. And Utahns resoundingly, over 60, almost 65% voted to build the rail system. I use this as an example because the kind of collaboration that it takes to solve challenging problems uh, is different than in the past. We used to get things done in our culture by finding out who was an authority and figuring out, making sure you had one extra vote, 50% plus one, whether the city council or the legislature. That was the traditional way of getting things done. Getting things done on complex problems in our culture today now requires that we work together in an incredibly intense and productive way, bringing people on board so that you really have 75, 85% of the public and public officials involved and on board so that you can keep your momentum over a long period of time. We just finished building 150 miles of rail line in Utah last year. It took us 15 years to do that. It took us longer from when we first envisioned doing that. These things are long and challenging and hard. If you want to change the air quality in Utah, if you want to make sure we have water for our future, if you want to make sure that we have great communities, for your children to live in. And I know some of you don't have children going, I'm not having kids yet. But you will, and you'll start to care deeply about the quality of places that they will grow up, the kinds of schools they will be in, you know, what kinds of safety or issues they will have about safety in their lives. And so Envision Utah is at the heart of all of those issues. Now, just a couple of years ago, Envision Utah undertook its most challenging, really most challenging, effort ever. Uh, with the governor, we chose to study the 11 issues that Utahns care most about. Did some of you get a copy of the report from the Vision Week? If you did, hold that up, OK? Uh, there will be more issues lead, but this is a copy of the Vision for 2050 that Utahns have chosen over the, last, uh, over the last three years. This is just one of the booklets on one of the 11 topics. This one's on education. There's one on water air quality, you name the thing you're concerned about and there's probably research, scenarios, and a public response on that. So we brought together, with the help of the governor, 400 experts looking at 11 topics in eight task forces. They studied for 18 months and designed the choices for Utah. It's not the right answer, but the choices. And then in the largest public outreach and most successful in American history, last April and May, 52,845 Utahns in a 60-day period 
answered a very long and extensive survey online. We were told that could never happen. Nobody would ever take a survey that long, and we would never get 50,000. Most regions that have tried this have gotten between five and the best ones at 10,000. We were five times that, and we did it through an incredible youth program for the schools. Over 300 schools were involved in taking this to, to the students and uh, out through the, uh, the parents and the grandparents. We did it in, a, in an effort with 100 partners, organizations like Intermountain Healthcare in the state who put it out through all of their efforts. We did it also in an intensive computer ad campaign. Did any of you see an ad last spring with the governor inviting you to take a survey pop up? Or yeah, I see a few hands going up. Or Studio C doing ads about taking this survey. And so we invited Utahns. We figure we, put, we, we, uh, we offered each Utah 13 chances to click. Everyone who has a computer, and that's 91% of Utahns, it offered them 13 chances to click and go take the survey. We know that hundreds of thousands of people are involved, but having 50,000 Utahns respond really matters. Now, why does it matter? We also did a Dan Jones survey of 1,200 uh, persons in Utah. Uh, it's a statistically valid survey. It proves the 52,000 were actually represented of the state. But when you go to the legislature, when you go to a city council, when you go back to the public, you can remind them that when we asked Utahns to share their voice, they did. Now, I was not surprised. We set what was, looked like an unreasonably high goal of 50,000 to do that. I may be the only one who was not surprised. I was terrified we wouldn't get there. Uh, I had tremendous help getting us there. But I have deep faith that you and other Utahns care deeply about the future of this place. And honestly, as I look at you and your generation, uh, I just kidded somebody else who has gray hair here, that soon we will be off the stage and you will be running it. Uh, you'll be the ones who are, are lifting and inviting and changing the world. And hopefully you will do it faster and better than we've done. By the way, along the way, I've learned one, one thing I just want to mention. Don't expect to be rewarded quickly for doing the right things in your life. Um, I don't know if any of you had any real experiences where you did the right thing and it didn't, but it didn't make you popular. Uh, you, you made the right choice about a, in, in a business or about money, and it didn't uh, bring you economic return. Uh, I just remind you that neither um, that the justice of God our culture, none of those things promises, promises quickly turns. It's a good thing that virtue is its own reward because often uh, other things are not going to reward you for having made the right choices. A few years ago, um, uh, a man came to Utah named uh, Xavier de Sousa Briggs. He was a visiting professor at MIT. He was originally from Italy, uh, strong Catholic background. He came to Utah to interview me for a couple days and others about Envision Utah. He was preparing to write a book. And this is actually the book he wrote. It's called Democracy as Problem Solving. He picked 10 examples across the world about how to change things in the complexity of our culture, how to build what he calls civic capacity, which is a fancy word for getting things done, building the will, the energy to make change in our society, in our culture, on important issues. Um, Envision Utah has a very long chapter in here that uh, Xavier, he goes by Zav, actually, the Zav wrote, uh, about, about us. Uh, we share the spotlight with efforts in Mumbai, India, Cape Town, South Africa, a place in Brazil, and other, a few places in the United States. Uh, I want to read you the name, the academic name of his chapter about us. This chapter is entitled, Rethinking the American West, a Civic Intermediary and the Movement for Quality Growth in Utah. He, he deserves an A for that title, I think. I spent nearly two days with him as we talked and became friends. Uh, and he was, he's a warm, wonderful individual. He's now one of the top leaders of the Ford Foundation in New York, and I went back to see him about a year ago. And as we talked, we, we were all both struck at the same time by a concept. He said, you know, Envision Utah has just put the golden rule into action. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You've just put the golden rule into action. You're treating people with respect. 
You listen to their ideas. You promise to study them fairly and openly to see what the outcomes will be of their ideas versus other ideas. You learn together. And then you come to conclusions together about the future, all based upon the choices that Utahns make about where they'd like to go. Um, it was fun to see us in this context. Um, there is something unique about Utah, and it's not just Utah. There are wonderful places all over America. But I have friends who are in the planning profession in many places in this country. Uh, many of them have been to Utah and different conferences. Every conference about how you grow regions, any, any group that does that or is involved in it has come to Utah over the last 10 years. They're pretty darn astonished. They look at our political environment and they scratch their heads and go, you built a rail system in Utah? And then I say, it's not because Utahns chose something out of step with their values. It's because they learned to align what they really wanted in life and their values with a new way of achieving that. This is not about tricking people. This is a matter about bringing people in and helping us all learn together. So all, all of these groups have come to Utah. Um, one of my closest friends is a man named John Fergadesi who has worked in more regions by far than I have, probably the top regional advisor in America. And he, said, he, he constantly reminds me of one thing about Utah. He says, Utahns care, care more deeply about the legacy they live their children and grandchildren than anywhere else he has ever been. Now, that, that feeling, that desire, that part of the values orientation is not unique to Utah. I just was helping Omaha do a regional vision. And it's there. It's embedded in them. But, but here in Utah, there's a special thing that happens because we care deeply about our children and our grandchildren. We care about the future of this place. We love this place. If we want to make it the best place it can be in this time of rapid change, as we face challenges that are increasingly more and more complex, the process that Envision Utah has championed, studied, learned through, grown with, with lots of Utahns, and there are a lot of people here a few people here have been on board since we started 20 years ago. But that process, at its core, based on values and treating people with honesty, respect, and then becoming friends and having trust, that process is the best way to change the world. In fact, it may be the only way that really works in the long term to make multi-generational improvement for the generations that will follow us. I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being so patient and listening uh, to me. Uh, I hope something I've said will be helpful to you. But most of all, I want to convey my respect for you being in the right place at the right time in your lives, preparing, getting ready, starting to build a firm foundation so that you can add to this future. And remember as you go, bring other people with you. Be a mentor, be a friend, be one who lifts one another. And if you do that, that'll bring you great, great joy in your life. I want to say thank you to my wife, Linda, who is here today. Um, I get awards for the things that she has helped me do every step of the way. I married the, the smartest woman I knew in high school at Skyline. Uh, she was also the cutest blonde in my math class. Um, marry well, because it makes so much difference in your life. Um, I can't tell you how much my life is richer because of the true partnership we have. We presided over a mission together. We've gone through all of these careers and challenges together. She has always been equally yoked with me, if not sometimes in the lead, on doing the right things at the right time so that we could bless other people's lives. Um, I'm thankful to her. Thank you so much for this award. Thank you, Elaine, and for, to the business school, uh, to President Hall and to UVU. It's a great honor, and my friends who are lawyers will remain in shock for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Do you want to do questions? All right, we have five minutes for questions. I know, I know I'm standing between some of you and the snack bar, uh, but we have five minutes before we break. Uh, anybody have a question they'd like to ask? If, no. They all want to get the snack bar quickly. 
Maybe I'll ask a question real quick, if that's all right, Robert. Okay. Uh, in our lecture series, we've been talking about relationships and how that have been helpful. What key relationships have helped you and as a CEO of uh, Geneva and in Envision Utah and that type? Yeah, you know, one of the fun things about being in the roles I've been in is I often stumble in, into places where I'm way over my head, like Geneva or Envision Utah about planning the future and so on. So I've been really lucky that people are always rushing up to me saying, let me teach you what I know before you make a mess of something. So, uh, you know, there are people all around you who know more than you do. The biggest mistakes we will make in our lives, whether it's in business or otherwise, is because we didn't get surround ourselves with good advisors. Uh, once in a, in a business, uh, one of my friends said to me, we have all the smart people we know. And I, I looked at him and said, are you kidding? I said, the smarter people we hire, the better off we're going to be. Um, it just sort of struck me. I, my, my goal in life has always been to surround myself with smarter people. Uh, and you should do the same thing. Don't ever be afraid just to say, I just don't know that. Um, and sometimes it's good to say, I don't know that when you do know it. Uh, I found that that helps build relationships. Uh, can you explain that to me? Uh, so I invite you to think about the fact that there's a network. Everywhere there is a network. Envision Utah is literally a network of people who care about the future. It has no political clout of any kind whatsoever. It's a group of people who come together who know that the future can be better if they work in alignment. And uh, those kind of relationships really matter. And we have friends in the legislature, we have friends in local cities and towns. Um, we have friends who are planners, we have friends who are engineers, we have friends in the real estate business, uh, developers. All of those relationships have come because we have wanted to be inclusive. So I don't know if that helps, but um, reach out. Uh, you have great faculty here. I've just had a lot of fun. I've, I've been reading their bios online, actually, the last couple days. So I'd recognize their pictures when they showed up. Um, by the way, you should do that, by the way, if you want to. That's a good thing to do, is to figure out who people are and where you're going. Um, but you have great mentors here at this university. You ought to take full advantage of them. Don't be scared of faculty. I have a daughter who's a law professor, and she's scary to people because she's really smart. But the smart ones actually learn to become her friend and come and get her advice. So always be building those relationships, that circle of friends. We probably have time for another question. Or two? Okay. Good. Well, let's. Uh, Good. It's great to have Robert here and his wife Linda. His son Matt is also here. And uh, thank you for being here today. Let's give Robert Grohl a round of applause. Thank you.